we'll start part two of the pollution forum. We are in for a really, really challenging session. I've been speaking to the speakers and they said they're going to beat me up. So all good fun. Our first speaker, I'll let him get ready and I'll let you all sit down. In this session, we're really going to start talking about some of the details. We're going to talk, start talking about the practicalities. As I've said over the past couple of days, the monitoring program that we've got coming up is truly and utterly scary. We're going to have to look at the technical challenges of delivering this program. We're going to have to skill up to deliver it. And probably like they've said with the carbon reduction plan and net zero, there's this empty bit that we don't know what it's going to look like yet in terms of project delivery. God help us. But there's some really intelligent people who've been looking at this, including our next speaker, Dr. Nick Mills of Southern Water. Nick. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Oliver. Well, you can be the judge of that after I finish the presentation. So thanks very much for inviting me. And I'll, I'll do a bit of context on my role um, and storm overflows and then get into the detail of what we've been doing in coastal waters, which we've got an awful lot of. So I lead what we're calling the Storm Overflow Task Force at Southern Water, just to confuse with the national one. Um, ultimately, we're building a plan to significantly reduce use of storm overflows in line with the Environment Act. In fact, much faster. That's our ambition. And we do think we've got um, a plan that could go much faster. We, we want to do a lot of it way before 2050, um, or we'll probably be out of jobs in the southern region. Uh, we've got a reputation to really turn around, as a lot of you have seen. Uh, a lot of that is in transformation has happened, but in terms of the public's trust of us and Alice's comments, I think that's really important. I think one thing I will say, though, is some of the solutions that we're talking about, once you get to the local community level, that trust comes back quite quickly. But at a national company level, that, that's where I think we really take a lot of hit. One of the things we're doing at the moment is testing some of these principles. A lot of what Alistair mentioned in his presentation, we are uh, testing at scale in catchments. And as he said, working with people like University of Exeter to understand how uh, effective they are, how much they cost. And all of that goes into what uh, our, our regional plan, our assumption base, which is then sound for when we go through uh, challenges with regulators and, 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 and arguably our investors. So alongside that is a big push to make sure we continue to measure and as transparent as possible with the data that we've got. Really, we want to move to a world where we, we are reporting water quality, not just there has been an overflow re release or not. So that's what I'll come on to in a minute, but a bit more context. Some of these, some of these slides just give a bit of context. So the three main things that we're really pushing hard uh, and are trialing now at scale in, in, in five catchments across our region are, are demonstrating these three broad intervention types. So source control, that is managing surface water, but also groundwater. 25% of our events are due to groundwater entering the sewer, both the public and the private sewer. So we're doing some work there, really understanding what's possible. Uh, and, and again, as a theme here, a lot of that is actually working on assets we don't own. Um, surface water, uh, there's lots of good examples of that. It's already mentioned, I won't go through that. There's a huge opportunity to monitor and control what we have already got much, much better. It's a very passive system at the moment. Automatic controls, coordination of pumping stations is pretty much non-existent in the industry. Uh, permits are kept within check to a pumping station. Really, we need to be talking about catchment start size permits. And obviously, if we need to, we will want to build bigger infrastructure where there's a pinch point where it's necessary. But that really, for us, is a last resort once the other two are exhausted. So a bit of context for you. I think you've all probably seen these sorts of stats, but that's a surface water catchment. You need to target rows and roofs, and that is what we're doing with solutions like these. So lots of good examples, uh, and Alistair's already put some really good pictures up already of, of what this stuff looks like. We are in the process of designing and implementing many of these uh, across our region. Uh, the property type suds have already delivered some really good results already, and I'll probably come back next year and talk about that. If, Oliver will let me. Um, and these are really attractive. And, uh, and, and the partnership working, although um, is intensive with time, 
certainly pr produces results and also allows us to rebuild that trust, which is very important. So, on to sort of the subject for today, which is we, we have an obligation, and, and obviously the Environment Act will, will require all people to do this, all companies to do this, um, to report what's happening in the network, report what's happening in, in the environment um, local to local to people. We already have a service, it's one of the first uh, in, the, in the UK, and in terms of uh, something I'm responsible for, this probably takes up more time than is proportional to the value of this project. Beach Boy is our online tool. It shows you uh, the 86 locations around our coast that have got uh, designated bathing water or a high recreational use. And they display all of the overflows that might impact those locations. Um, we also got all of those uh, historically displayed in the table so people can look at that data in real time. Uh, and that is now polled every every hour. All right, all right. Our um, ambition is to roll that inland at the right time, but that's a lot more data and we haven't quite got a head around how to display that because inland locations do uh, behave differently to coastal, which I'll come on to. But really at the moment, this is quite a binary, quite a crude tool. It, we want to get to the point where this is displaying water quality risk as opposed to there has or there hasn't been some activity. Because some activities, uh, with the right conditions will have no impact on the bathing water. At the moment, we are potentially impacting local tourism and communities um, uh, unfairly so. So one of the things that we really wanted to try, uh, and Rob's going to talk about this later, so I won't steal too much of this thunder, is the concept of actually measuring water quality. And when I talk about water quality here, I'm talking about E. coli, risk to human health. That is by far one of the biggest issues our customers, our stakeholders, uh, have with our activity so what is it so we want to be able to move to that point i'll come on to our journey and, and, and what we did in the in the in the pilots that are running um so we've actually commissioned two boys uh one in kent one on the south coast uh near hailing island near, near portsmouth and these boys have now been in the water for a number of months and the idea is that we want to run these for 12 months and we want to capture data very frequently. We're talking every 15 minutes, maybe more frequently. Um, at the moment, those bathing waters, these are designated bathing waters, will receive one sample a week between May and September. And some of these locations we know, and it has changed a little bit since lockdown, but a lot of these locations have been used all year round. Uh, Hailing Beach in particular is a really popular windsurfing, kite surfing. People will go out when it is stormy because that's, that's the preferential time. So the current measurement sampling regime, um, many have argued is not fit for purpose. And I, I think we agree it doesn't cater for what people want to use. And also that sampling regime is, is too slow. You're talking about labs, lab samples coming back several days after the sample is taken. That's, that's not what the public want. So you've got Rob in the room. Um, we wanted to test his claims. So we've gone out uh, and bought from Proteus two of these boys. Um, Rob will talk about those in a minute, uh, but the key thing that we're interested in is the ability to measure E. coli in, in a real-time environment. So these are obviously secured to the um, to the to the to the floor, the seabed, with a weight. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about now is is the challenges of locating these in a representative location. So you can't put these in the same location as the EEA sample point. You cannot put these in a surf surf zone. And really they need about two meters of water as a minimum so that's the current constraints and i think there's definitely a need for us to think about whether we can improve on that and whether we can let these sensors get closer to shore so that's one of the considerations one of the things that we've learned throughout this so lots of debate on where it goes the top right is uh is the actual designated area it's this very long strange triangle uh because there's a big sand bank that goes out from hailing island so the boy is actually positioned just to the right or just to the east of that uh, and Beachlands West is the one that is very popular with windsurfers uh, and a lot of questions have been raised about whether outfalls inside Langston Harbour actually impact that location. The modelling suggests it, it doesn't um, but that trust that we talked about is not there so one of the motivators is to understand that. So where you put it is a really um, really important consideration and I think right now um, Having to put them in two meters of water is, is not is not um, is not ideal. 
uh, and we'd love to get them further inshore. So that, that's definitely a challenge for, I think, for the sector. The other big challenge is, is it representative? So this is a, a very, very bad uh, modeled event where we've actually discharged from a, an emergency outfall, which you can see actually could affect a large area of the location. So where you put that buoy, where you put that instrument, you must, you must understand whether that buoy is in a, in a potential spot that doesn't see uh, representative conditions. So if we put it in that blue area, we wouldn't be representing that beach. And that's a really, really important point when we're talking about these, and it's something we're learning. Uh, and in fact, we're we're relocating one of the boys as a result of that because it, it's it, it wasn't in the right location initially. So, where you put it, spend some time thinking would be our advice so far. Um, we haven't finished the trial yet, but we will certainly make make more um, make public those learnings. Um, I'm sure Rob would love to put a paper together on that. Installation again, um, two methods. In Kent, we use the local fishermen, uh, and in, uh, in in Hailing Island, we use the, a contractor that normally works for the MOD in Portsmouth Harbour. So, um, very very different vessels. I'll let Rob talk about the challenges of those two approaches. Um, but that that's the boy you can see in the water, um, successfully deployed. I'm I'm pleased to say that they're working they're working really well, and we are going through what is now quite a challenging calibration process. And I think we all. Uh, I think Robert would agree we, we've, this has been more challenging than we thought so one of the things we must do is get a representative range of samples corresponding lab samples and me uh, instrument measurements throughout the range that we might see and we're probably now up to about 40 samples and we're yet to sample a high reading uh, at any of these locations so the water quality is very good at these locations when we've gone to sample them um, we are seeing the instrument pick up spikes and things, but uh, actually then getting out and taking a sample at that point has been challenging. So we are, between Rob and I, we are configuring and we're working very closely with the University of Portsmouth. That's Professor Alex Ford from Portsmouth helping me with uh, a really tough day on the beach um, sampling Hailing Island. So one of the things that we're now moving to is a, a, an auto sampler set up in parallel with the instrument uh, and a location where we can grab those samples when it goes high. So calibration has been uh, a lengthier process, but I think it's a process that once we've completed this exercise will be really beneficial um, for others, because in theory, we'll better set a curve up that should be, should be universal for other locations. We'll, we'll conclude that in a few months' time. So calibration, big exercise. The other thing that is definitely worth um, thought, and we are not through this yet, is, is what threshold do you use? So you've obviously got the WHO and the EU thresholds. They're all very statistical based. They're all designed around uh, spot samples. We're now moving to data that could be as frequent as a few minutes apart. These thresholds then come into a bit of challenge because you're working over a different uh, distribution because all of these are 95 or 90 percentile. Um, so drawing a line at 500 CFU might not be appropriate it might even have to be location specific. So we are still working this through and working with the councils who are part of the collaborative trial. We're working with the EA as well on what is appropriate. But I think to our knowledge, this is the first time we've really, um, first time that we're aware of where this threshold might have to change because you're working with a very different data set. So, and I'm not a statistician, so you can't ask me any questions about this in detail. Um, I'll, I'll finish. In fact, I'm, I'm ahead of time, which is good. Um, the future, what does this all do? So our, our ambition is, is, is to certainly trial these um, and, and make some decisions on further rollout of this or other, other types of instrument in coastal locations early next year. Um, I think what this enables is very exciting because you're going to be very data rich. Where we've previously been relying on um, very sparse set of samples in only a short period of the year. We're going to be very data rich for a, for a coastal location throughout the year, assuming you put it in the right place. The future, I think, is akin to what Wessex have done at Wally Weir, which is with that data, you have the ability to build a predictive model uh, for these locations. So whether you need the boy deployed uh, continuously is one of the discussions. But actually, if you deployed enough of these in the right locations, you could build that predictive model and only have a few 
uh, boys in the future is one of the things that we're debating. That said, we've still got uh, over 80 locations to monitor if we're just looking at the uh, designated bathing waters and an awful lot more on top of that what we know are popular recreational spots. So the future is predicted models in, in our mind uh, and are very encouraged by what Wessex have achieved at Worley Weir. So I think that was where I was going to wrap up. I'm very happy to take questions um, and also give some time back if we need it in the programme. Oliver. Our next speaker is uh, Richard Bragg of uh, United Utilities. And you did uh, a lot of work on uh, ammonia monitoring in, in, in the wastewater system. And I asked, I've asked Rich to give us some knowledge from what he's, what he's done. So, Rich, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks, Oliver. Um, we start off as a, a little bit of an introduction. So I've been at United Utilities for 12 years as um, principal instrumentation engineer. And predominantly, um, a lot of that time has been spent around um, water quality, wastewater quality. And when we talk about ammonia specifically, um, we've been doing this for a long time. We think we've got about 250 ammonia analyzers on our process sites in wastewater. Um, and you can see from the map on the left is um, we've got about 70 of those installations on fine effluent. So relatively safe, easy to measure um, locations. Um, over the years, we've had various frameworks with um, different instrument manufacturers. We have done pilots, proof of concepts, um, lots of stuff has gone in and, and come out again. And we've also done a, a trial about 12 years ago with the WRC where we looked at um, a more structured approach to trialing instrument manufacturers against each other. Um, a facility at Seven Trent, facilitated, facilitated by Servitech. So um, I'm sure a lot of people have seen that, certainly our manufacturers have seen it, um, and we can share some of those results today. But ultimately, from my experience, it's about five things for instrumentation. It's about selecting the right instrument if you need it in the first place. It's about getting a sample to the instrument, um, keeping it clean, and then at that point, once it's in, you've got to make a decision about do you trust the, the data, the information that you're getting from it? Um, and finally, um, an eye on the future as well to, to make sure we don't become complacent in what we're doing. So I'll try not to read through all of this, but when we talk about instrument selection, I spend pretty much all my time at UU saying, do you really need it? What are you going to do with the data? Do you understand that an ammonia analyzer might be a, a one line in a scope item, but it's a fairly um, substantial installation. There's a, a lot of infrastructure that needs to go in with this equipment. Um, people say self-cleaning, they don't realize that self-cleaning needs reagents. We need to access instruments um, to top them up, to keep them working. Um, sometimes people don't necessarily understand what the measurement range is for this equipment. And like we've been talking about river water quality um, all morning. But how are we going to find enough sample data to make sure we've got the right instrument at the right place at the right time to, to provide some value from it? Um, there's different ways to do this as well. So as we talk about ammonia, we'll talk about the, the wet chemistry approach, which um, is what we traditionally use on our process um, sites. And then you've got like the, the um, SON type approach with ion selective probes that are slightly easier to install and, and maintain, but a little bit more maintenance heavy. Um, and just a, an understanding really that once we put a monitoring in, we, we need to go back to it to make sure we can calibrate it and, and to maintain it as well. So it's not just a fit and forget. We're left with, I wouldn't say the burden, but there's an ongoing cost um, for us to keep this instrument alive. And from some of the, the data that we did on um, various manufacturers, when we've looked at frameworks or we've looked at trials, our view at United Utilities is the instrument whole life cost is about four to six times the purchase price. So it's making sure that OPEX budgets are, are set up to make sure we can keep that instrument going in the future. And the, the point at the bottom, um, ammonia performance week one of a trial we did, no one sells instruments that don't work anymore. So when we talk about frameworks and accuracy and repeatability, I'm less concerned about that. And we're more bothered about the whole life cost. How easy is it for us to sustain that measurement over a 10 or a 15 year period to get some value from it? Um, now just a, a final point is we can get data from ammonia or from any instrumentation but we don't always see the context in it so we, we talk about the in-river water quality this morning but without 
um, rain or weather data without river flow data and um, you're a little bit blind we're getting a number but not necessarily understanding what's impacting that number over time so getting a sample to an instrument there's two ways to do it we can either put the instrument in the sample or we can bring the sample to the instrument and we do both in different applications and for any given application there's generally a discussion about what's the best way to do it so on the left um, I went to site with um, Ben who was in the audience somewhere a couple of weeks ago and we pulled this SONS type approach out with an ion selective probe in and, and the image on the left and as you can see our biggest concern with that type of installation is keeping it clean do we put an air blast on it water chemical clean um, the wipers and different manufacturers that I've seen over the last couple of days have got various different approaches but in reality those instruments need a, a little bit more attention we feel to make sure they kept clean and they kept working and because they're in the process um, we happen to bring them out of the process to maintain them to calibrate them so we need to take that into consideration as well um, and on the right a, a different way to do it is to take the sample out of the process and bring it to the instrument so we have had some sites on fine left one where we didn't have enough depth in the um, the channels or the chambers that we were going into to put the instrument so we bring the sample out with peristaltic pump we run it through at a kiosk in a safe clean environment and um, we drop out some sediment we have some cleaning um, on the probe and on some filters in there as well and do it in a controlled environment um, but obviously it's a lot more infrastructure as well we're, we're pouring concrete to get um, the kiosk in the that picture of a kiosk always surprises people how big it is but actually it, it needs to be right for health and safety so the guys can work safely in there without causing any issues in reality it could be a bit smaller but that works better for us um, we need power and comms to these instruments as well which is a big consideration when we're going out to remote locations um, and also there's a bit of a limitation around how close we can get that to the process and again in the context of river water quality monitoring if if we're looking at at UU we've got 2300 CSOs and we've got about 700 wastewater treatment works we could be talking up to 6,000 of these kiosks or 6,000 sons or somewhere in the middle um, along some quite sensitive locations so the next bit is once it's in, how are we going to keep it clean? Um, maintenance is the biggest issue that we have about instrumentation. And um, I think I said earlier, we've got about 55,000 instruments in United Utilities, and we've got a really wide range of maintenance tasks that needs to be done on those. Um, we take a different approach based on how critical the instrument is, what site it's on, what it's doing, what it's used for. So the final effluent monitors that we talked about earlier, we have a, a service contract with our partners over at Servitech um, for 70 of those. And then the rest of them, we maintain ourselves. But for all of them, we've, a lot of these analyzers are fairly complex pieces of kit or the sons take a specialist knowledge to be able to maintain them. So we also try and reduce the burden on our sort of more skilled technicians by having some operations tasks in there as well to keep the filters clean, to get the instrument out, check the system, cleaning systems are working properly and to do a lot of that we we can incur quite a lot of cost in making sure we, we can have access to these instruments so like final effluent back end of a works we now need a path to make sure someone can get there they are handling reagents which could be a larger volume so we have to go less now they need to get the car close to the instrument we need access roads we're working in close proximity to water we've got handrails and what it comes down to for us for the whole life cost model is um, brackets and cleaning systems uh, if we've got a bracket that we can get out easily and quickly they, they, we find we're more likely to maintain that equipment better um, if it's a bit of a struggle and we can't get it out and the weather's not great we find things don't get looked at and, and don't get given the attention they might need so we've invested a lot of time at, at UU and working with our supply chain on bracket design as daft as it sounds and on cleaning systems trying to standardize things across manufacturers to Keep things simple but also allow us to provide like standardized training packages for our operation staff our instrument guys and um, provide common spares and equipment and stuff like that as well and i don't i feel people don't see the complexity and all the stuff that goes into this uh, 
we've talked about cleaning systems and reagents and where we find instruments have got a, a self-cleaning system people forget that that self-cleaning system might have chemicals which have got a shelf life or that are toxic to dispose of so making sure that whole systems approach to an instrumentation is considered in the whole life cost and the design is, is really important to us um, you can see on the, the left was something we pulled out one of our pump solutions so they're not great either just to contradict the one with the sonde earlier um, the next slide is when we did a, a trial of seven instruments from seven different manufacturers um, in reality we saw that the, the total maintenance activities that were required to keep those instruments working varied um, massively across um, manufacturers and some of that could have been down to um, location or installation conditions but when we talk about a whole life cost if we put an arbitrary cost of say 30 pounds per hour on one of our techs or on one of our partners techs then that is what's going to win you or lose you a framework when you're bidding for it with a water company is that whole time to maintain things as part of the day-to-day the -day activities and we see from week seven which was the sort of midpoint in our trial and um, we talked about earlier that everything was fine on day one the instruments are all next to each other they're all being maintained but we start to see um the data starting to to change a little bit and ammonia drifts inherently we expect that with calibrations to bring it back in again but we do see some sort of odd performance flatlining um, lots of things going on there that we, we had to address and the next point for me so we have decided we need an instrument we have put it somewhere where we think is appropriate and we are confident that we're keeping it clean but the first question I always ask to anyone when I go to site is do you trust the numbers that are coming out of it the, the number on the screen do you trust it and the things I look for is clay I went to one the other day and there's a, a calibration sheet with a footprint on it and you're like right okay someone's been to this instrument they've been working on it and it's a, a working document so I know with a good level of confidence that on those dates that instrument was working and quite frequently we go into the telemetry system or SCADA and, and do a bit of a check just to understand what my confidence is in some of those values. Um, also, we've started to use the benefits of intelligent instrumentation. So we use a lot of property bus at United Utilities, mainly for um, cost benefits when we're construction, constructing works. But with property bus comes enhanced information and diagnostics from analyzers. So our framework kit at the moment is the HAC Amtax and we developed a Profibus faceplate that goes into all of our HMIs and SCADA systems for that instrument. So it's standard, it doesn't really cost us anything to deploy, now we've developed it. But remotely from anywhere we can start to see a little bit more about what's going on in that instrument to, to get some confidence in it. So that includes like the maintenance activities, things like reagent levels and we can start to be a lot more proactive and preventative in our maintenance strategy with it. Um, say asset management is quite an important one for us making sure that when our contractors are, are providing or delivering solutions in United Utilities that things are registered correctly so that allows us to make sure that the right maintenance tasks are generated internally or for our partners and we can manage the whole life of that asset through um, design and commissioning through to decommissioning replacement but also tracking that data as well with a, a consistent ID through our IT systems into our um, um, like data management systems as well. Um, I say checks ag against spot samples. So I think my final slide from the, the trial we did is we saw that over a 14 week period with eight ammonia probes, we saw um, a correlation of spot samples between 98% and 43%. So these things vary wildly based on the maintenance activities that are done. Um, and even against standards, um, doing local checks on the instruments we saw the best performance of like 4.3% all the way through to 47% where we were having issues with kit. I will caveat that but we find that labs have the challenges too so taking a spot sample and transporting it to a lab 50 miles away um, you need to be aware of temperature and stabilizing that standard before it gets to the lab you need to make sure it's in the right machine in the lab you need to make sure you're following the right methods so I not a huge fan of lab samples I think a spot sample done properly is probably better on site we find that for this type of equipment anything that can self calibrate to, to help us understand the data remotely is a, a good thing for us so for that reason we for the on-site installations we tend to standardize on um, 
wet chemistry analyzers because they provide that ability to run an auto cal every predetermined amount of time. We find ammonia needs a high and a low cal to, to wake it up and, and check it at low levels as well. So we get that facility with a lot of the wet chemistry equipment we use. The, the common issues we find, are, I think, are obvious that these things are really difficult at sort of milligrams per litre or parts per million, some of the permits we're receiving, parts per billion in ammonia. So there needs to be an understanding that this is actually a really difficult thing for us to do. Um, we've talked about lab issues. And the gist of it is that regular calibration is required with this equipment. There's no, from our experience, there's no ammonia sensor or um, ammonia te sensing technology that we could just put in and leave for six months. It needs regular attention. I think my view is probably every two weeks. Survey Tech have probably got a number, all the other water companies will have their own opinions on it. But personally, we need to be going to these things every couple of weeks to make sure that um, things are kept clean and things are working properly. And that's even with an autocal system. Like I said earlier, ammonia is really sensitive to drift and inherently drift. So I think you need to be aware of some of these things as well. I guess the final one for me and, and sort of my role is more around looking at what's next. So frustrates me a little bit. It's, the technology is difficult. Um, we, but we've got it on final effluent, but our um, permits, we, we're based on lab samples. So if we're being driven by regulations to put some of this equipment in on our sites or off our sites and, and look at river health, then why isn't the numbers that we're providing for final effluent good enough rather than having to provide lab samples as well? And I think on the back of that, that there's no real regulatory certification scheme for this or for the Environment Act parameters that are coming in. and actually i'd welcome that to say well now is this a, a regulatory driver to maintain that equipment to a standard or to provide a, a regulatory um, standard for the sampling or the, the calibration or the maintenance of that equipment as well which personally i'd, I'd welcome um, danny's probably sick of me saying drones every time i get up on stage lately but instruments are difficult to keep clean and maintain so we're looking at a lot of drone technology to take the instrument to the process get it out again, clean it, calibrate it, and, and look at more like a, a periodic approach to sampling some of these parameters as well on difficult to get to locations. So we're working, the, the, the boat drone on the left is a company called Altitude Thinking, which has been approached us via our innovation lab, we're looking at some of this with. Um, the drone on the right, just an example of other stuff we're doing is um, from a company called Explicit, and we're looking at greenhouse gas monitoring with those. Um, Always open to innovation. Ammonia, uh, when I was looking at some of the, the results from the trial 12 years ago, we're still using the same models of instruments today. So the chemistry's not changed. Mike's nodding his head probably since he was a lad. Um, there's not many ways to do it. We're seeing some new novel techniques coming in, bringing in like various different models that we're looking at. Um, we're doing a little bit of work on the microfluidics. Um, now Southwest sensors are in the room and we're doing a little bit of work with Clearwater sensors on our innovation lab again. So standard chemistry but a slightly different approach and can we get a more maintenance a reduction in our maintenance approach and we are open to suggestions we are open to surrogates we've been speaking to rob and, and proteus and i won't stay at least under but i've got some really promising data around well why are you looking at that when you can look at this and you'll still get the same net results um, we've been doing some work with Jacobs um, and we use a sumo modeling package for our wastewater treatment um, plant design to say, can we look at soft sensors? Do we really need ammonia? If we've got DO, temperature, pH across the process, can we not look at building some sort of intelligent self models with, that we calibrate instead of putting sensors in to reduce our maintenance costs and, and reliability? Um, and then ultimately, bottom left, we are open to suggestions really um, we've had a good look at some equipment here in the, in, in the conference this week but we have got an ideas website of suppliers approach me and our team all the time saying how can we get this idea in well go on the website you can submit an idea we also run the innovation lab which we take a bit more of a proactive approach to product development with SMEs and, and, and small businesses um, and there's the Offwater Innovation Fund, which hopefully most people know about, that has largely been aimed at water companies and innovation driven internally, but 
I think there's a new round being released next year to say it's more driven by um, industry itself um, without water company support. So if you've got a great idea, um, please have a look at some of the links in the slides. And that is me, bang on time. So, Right, okay. Um, I'm so glad, Mike, that you asked um, that question to somebody else, not me. So, but no, I don't want a question from you later on either. So, right, um, I'm here to talk about something a little bit different. Um, bit of thinking out of the box as well. Um, um, and particularly we're to talk about Proteus um, and what we can and cannot do. Um, so there's gonna be some fundamental questions. There's a few warts in here as well. Um, there's probably gonna be a lot more questions that will come out of this as well, rather than answers, but we'll, we'll get started. So we all know about Environment Act. Uh, I'm not gonna really go too much about it, but numbers have been thrown around the room. There's about 56,000. We hear that it may be less than that, but ultimately the cost to um, the water industry you look at Totex and OPEX, it's going to be well in excess of £5 billion. Pounds. It's almost incomprehensible. Um, and I think there are people in this room who will probably say it'll be a lot more than that. And I heard someone say last night, I think it was Gary, saying that the global industry was worth £20 billion. I don't think that was anywhere even near. Um, I think the UK would eat half of that. So, a um, little bit about what... Um, the options are for um, measuring water quality. Okay, so there are three main approaches. You have analy wet analyzers, which we just talked about. We have multi-parameter sons, and we have the traditional manual sampling. Uh, so they're sort of color coded, um, just very approximate. Green is good, um, and got a few ambers. But generally, what you find is that analyzers are generally very, very good, but overall pretty expensive to install, um, and you get a lot. A wider range of parameters okay but footprint costs installation and maintenance are significantly more multi-parameter sons probably the sort of the, the easy solution in the room in many respects um, it's got lots of um, trade-offs and what have you but generally speaking um, pretty good instrument to install good accuracy um, small footprint you can put them more or less anywhere you want um, and even hide them um, but like with all of them, they do need maintenance. Um, and then obviously with manual sampling, it's very targeted um, and it's a one moment in time solution, which is not really gonna help any of us here. So what is a multi-parameter sonde? So let's picture of one here. Um, they typically are able to record uh, locally or send the data digitally, wirelessly, whatever, however you want. They can actually behave almost like they're a connected SCADA system. So even though they're in the middle of Timbuktu, you can have them on a wireless API and they will just feel like they're part of the infrastructure. Okay, they traditionally measure sort of the, the more traditional parameters, things like pH, DO, conductivity, turbidity, we all know about. Some of the ones which are mentioned in the Environment Act. Uh, Proteus does it a little bit different. We can measure some of the organic parameters. So we measure the POD, COD and the carbon and, and the coliforms, um, but you do need to calibrate them. So typically most parameters on our sonds will be calibrated every three or six months. Some are actually every 12, um, but there is one bad boy in the room and that's ammonia. Um, and it's an iron selective electrode and it um, needs maintaining or calibrating typically about once a month. Um, there's no getting away from that. Um, it's just what it is. Um, so that's really a pro in a nutshell, um, lots of ways to install them. So some technical drawings here. Um, we've got uh, bottom left here, we've got a water course with a stilling well, can be vertical, we've got open channels, so it could be a final effluent or an influent, chamber mount, and we also do bank side as well. So you can pump the peristaltic pump to a chain, uh, to a kiosk and, and sample from there. Um, it very much depends on the location as to whether you want to do it. Typically, maybe if it's a health and safety issue, and you don't want to put anyone near a river, you might decide to do a bank side. But if you, if you deploy a unit in a stilling well like that, you should be able to retrieve it from the bank uh, with a single person. So Environment Act, um, I'm glad Philip's gone home. Um, is it achievable or is it out of reach? Um, I haven't got an answer for this one. 
Um, but section 82 tells us that we have to measure DO, turbidity, pH, temperature, and uh, ammonia, okay? Um, and anything else deemed um, necessary by the Secretary of State. So that's possibly anything, okay? We've got some major questions. Um, are these parameters actually specific enough or are they just purely contextual? Um, I would say they're just completely contextual, okay? Where and how will they be installed? We, nobody really knows at the moment other than upstream and downstream, okay? Installation standards, you could get three, 10, 20 different people installing the same probe in the same location and somehow do it differently, okay? So where's the standards? And do, do we truly realize the maintenance involved? So if you decide to employ um, an iron selective electrode on it, your maintenance regime goes um, to, on a monthly, okay? If you decide not to have it, then you then pick the next calibration interval, which might be something like pH, um, which will be average three or six months. So you, if you decide three months, you've just reduced your maintenance by 75%. Okay, so fundamental questions. Okay, and probably lastly is, do we have the people or skills to do it? There, well, the answer to that is right now, there isn't. There's, even if every manufacturer got in a room together, and also that we'll try our best. It isn't gonna happen in its current format. However, so what I'm gonna do now is just show you some data so to, to bring a bit of perspective into all of this, okay? So uh, this is, this was completely accidental. Um, we were bidding for a contract at the time and it was just to show um, a client on how um, our data portal worked, okay? so we just. Put a, uh, one of our process units in a river um, near where I live, as it happens. Um, see what we find, and it was just really to show the sort of the rhythms and the, the signatures of the, of the river. So um, there are no obvious uh, sources of uh, pollution. Okay, and what I would say is that our knowledge of pollution is sort of indirect, in inversely related to our ability to measure it. So what's going to happen is, as technology advances. It's going to be seemingly more problems that you come come across so and that's what you're going to find i'm afraid okay so this is a case study uh, whereby um it was actually a farmer it doesn't really matter um I mean, everyone's going about water companies but agriculture is a big issue as well but this was deployed um uh, probably for about a month or something like that uh 15 minute data um and this farmer had been discharging raw slurry 15 years um, unabated no one knew anything about it so what I'm going to do now is we're going to put the Environment Act hat on okay and we're going to see if we can spot the pollution all right so the first one I'm going to uh, tell you is that there's three events that are going to happen this it's about five or six days all the parameters are going to go down the left hand axis apart from uh, conductivity and redox which will go on the right so we'll put turbidity Okay. It's a little bit spiky because it's pretty low level. We're only running between about four and eight NTU. So are there any forms of pollution that you can see in there? I think you'd all probably agree. It's a couple of undulations, but no. Depths. The reason why that's on there is to show you whether there's any rainfall events, and there aren't any. So you probably wouldn't expect there to be. Temperature. Again, it's in the act. Nothing obvious. pH. Again, pretty flat nothing conductivity gradually increasing because um, last year was quite a dry year and as the base level dropped you generally get a slight increase in conductivity but again no particular event and we have ORP again fairly rhythmatic and then we have ammonia which is trickling along the bottom you can see a little uptick up here okay but if you're a regulator or a water company or wherever you're looking at it you would not be concerned by it. Right, so there are three significant pollution events there and they would not be picked up. As soon as we put BOD on it, clear as day. And what actually happened is that I remember watching these come, well, the data coming through and the alarms were triggering. And on the case of the third one, it happened at the same time every day. I think, um, yeah, it's, um, the farmer was discharging a slurry tank at about 10 p.m. every night 
and there was about a five or six hour transit time. So it was going past where the sun was uh, around about six hours later. So it's coming through about five, was five a.m. in the morning, and you can see it every time, same, same time. So on the third one, we connected the Proteus, we dismantled it from the telemetry, we put a Bluetooth unit, and I basically spot sampled and walked up the river um, every 500 meters. And I actually walked past the source of the pollution because it was in an undercut on a bank because the, the last reading went to zip more, more or less zero, right, it's behind me. So I walked back and there it was, hidden. You'd never have found it, okay? So what I'm saying here is there's a clear need to use a parameter that means something, that can actually do something. So using parameters like BOD and COD, and I ground that there's not a lot of technology out there to do it, but you can see in this case, 15 years of pollution stopped overnight. So this is a little bit of a image. Okay, so you've got the river going left to right. Um, just so it happens to flow into the river team, which is um, uh, for Philip. But you've got a Proteus down here and you've got a source of pollution here. Uh, the actual farm is at the top and you can probably just see a road. Now the real mystery with all of this is that that road is actually a ridge line. The farm is actually on the other side. So how does a farmer get underneath the road and discharge it downhill to a river. We still don't know, but the Environment Agency turned up that day and um, after it was reported and the problem was resolved. Um, so there was an action plan created. So happy ending. But unfortunately, there would never have been a report of a dead fish because there was never a fish in there. And there probably hasn't been for 15 years. So if you, if an Environment Agency I mean, I've, I've done it myself. I've reported an incident, and unless there's any fish kill, then the response is a little bit different, which is fair enough. You won't get a response there because there's no fish. Okay, so um, hopefully this has worked. This is actually a, a video of it. Okay, not particularly big, but you can see the color it's changing the river by. Okay, and you can, there's some readings on the side there, but the ammonia coming out is actually only two milligrams per liter, and the BOD is 14. Okay, so this river now is gonna hopefully start recovering. So that just gives you a bit of an example of what you can do. Um, and it's exciting in that instance, but unfortunately, those type of events happen everywhere. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the practicalities of uh, monitoring. So we, we have talked about location. I mean, to be able to put a concrete pad in a kiosk, wired SCADA or power, it's going to be pretty significant. Um, Multi-parameter SONs have a much smaller footprint and you can run them on a small solar panel. So a lot more versatile. Um, generally speaking, a lot less maintenance. We were doing the apprentice competition yesterday and from scratch, the apprentices were doing it within 10 minutes. Um, talk about installation quality. That's gonna have, a, unfortunately, a huge bearing um, on, a, on um, results. Uh, I'll show you a photo in a minute, which shows you of a bad install. Are the parameters actually relevant? Okay. And is it realistic to maintain how many sensors they're going to be on a monthly basis. So that's just based on 30,000, that's 360,000 visits a year. Really, that's just not gonna happen, okay? And that's without call outs. So if you get an issue, and maybe if, you, if there are manufacturers that aren't quite as reliable and you need more call outs, that's, that could double. Um, so carbon footprint on all of that. Can the parameters be used without interpretation? So. If you start with the five parameters within um, the Environment Act, everyone's going to interpret them differently. Everyone in this room will have a different view on what there is. Just like that graph earlier, I'd probably say that everyone would say there wasn't any pollution, but reality was there was. Okay, but, and what will it mean to Joe Bloggs? You know, the public outside of here, you know, they need to be able to see data that instantly means something. So BOD, all right, they might not understand that there are clear thresholds for a, a, a healthy river or not, but something like E. coli, 
that provides instant recognition. There are you know, di directives for that. Okay, so yeah, parameters don't provide the information for the stakeholders and the public need, and you can share this data. So once you've got this data, if you decide to do it with an API or and send it to a fishing club or the rowing club or a swimming club or other organizations, it's one to many. Uh, and that's actually the challenge that obviously we've got with um, Nick, um, with, with Southern, is how, what we do next with, with that data. So what companies are regulated on those parameters? They are probably your most important parameters. Bathing waters, they need E. coli enter a pocket. And for agriculture, really it's pea and ammonia. Okay. Um, so at the end of the day, we need something that will translate into some sort of traffic light system as to whether a river is healthy or not, whether it's improving. Okay, so a little bit about calibration maintenance. So most parameters, every three to six months, okay, take a couple of hours at each site. Okay, you can do it in situ. However, uh, I hate to go on about it, but this is the dose, the, the pinch of uh, re realism, is that ammonium probes will need roads team calibration every four or six weeks they drift all manufacturers are the same there won't be a single manufacturer that could honestly say that their probe does not drift after four weeks or possibly even before and they have interference so other ions can get through the membrane so classic with ammonia is potassium ions they do need regular maintenance okay just like kind of every water quality instrument um, they also need a replacement ISE tip. So that will be done every six months, possibly 12 if you're lucky. The, 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 the calibration software will usually tell you when you need to do it. And then there's a the sensitivity and accuracy. So I'm just gonna show you a little example of, of, of that. But uh, typically an ammonium probe on, an, on a multi-parameter son from any manufacturer is plus or minus 10% um, plus two milligrams. There is a lot of tech out there, but there is, generally speaking, a lack of good experience. There's no one manufacturer out there with, whether it's wet or ISC um, technology saying, and a user saying that it's brilliant, okay? It does need more work. Do, and then because of the way the Environment Act is sort of providing those, those five parameters, you've got the first four, it's ability, pH, temperature, and DO, but the focus just, moves to ammonia and so what we're saying is now is are we putting the future of our rivers on the data of ammonia probes bit of a scary situation really so just going to give you an example and this really can apply to any ammonia instrument if you put if you've got a CSO of 10 litres a second at 10 milligrams per litre okay into a river of two and a half thousand litres a second so that's probably a river four or five meters wide, something like that. Okay, got a background reading of 0 0.2, okay. The CSO will only elevate the ammonia in the river by 0 0.004 milligrams per litre. That's just a simple mass, mathematical equation, okay. So what you get then is with the, the specs of, of an ISE, of uh, that is that the new reading is 0 0.204 plus or minus two milligrams per litre. A wet analyzer will do it to within 0.06. Um, that calculation is based, don't mind saying, it's based on an amp tax. So that's about as good as you're gonna get. So in this particular instance, that CSO will not be picked up. If you get a bigger river, the same CSO, again, you've got no chance. So realism, being realistic, it's very, very important. Um, so I'm not going to focus away from the sort of the bad things and move on to some of the good things. So it's happened with the case studies. Uh, we do one with Thames Water and Earthwatch, uh, the smarter uh, catchments on the even load. Uh, so which is in Oxfordshire. We measure upstream and downstream. Now this project started before the whole idea of the Environment Act. Um, so it's a bit of a coincidence uh, really. But this is all the data from two probes up and downstream of uh, treat works. A hell of a lot of data, okay? And there's a lot of slides, so I'm gonna skip through some of them, but we now have to make sense of all of this. 
So we have some basic ones like turbidity. We have dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen, the upstream one is the blue one. Downstream is the green. You can see the double peak. Okay, very characteristic of a treatment works. And you'll see that in very obvious examples of where there's a treatment works, overloading a small river. Uh, we have pH. So the pH on the downstream has been lowered slightly. Nothing massively um, big about that. Temperature, as you probably would expect. And, it can, and you, have a, you do have a changing baseline. So this will vary throughout the year. But in this time of the year, in January, it was raising the temperature of the river. Okay. Uh, we then have the likes of conductivity. Again, you can start seeing the twin peaks here. Uh, and then we have the ammonia. Okay, you can see the bottom one is pretty much flat lining, and then you have the peaks caused by the downstream. Okay, all really good. So then what we started doing is um, comparing it to the likes of BOD. And it, the, the great thing about measuring some BOD, we do it's optical, the snow drift. Okay, so what you'll see later on is that the ammonia probes will drift. Okay, whereas the optical BOD will not. Okay, so you can see here again, um, that you've got the twin peaks on the BOD. But really interestingly for this site, the morning peak is very much reduced. So we're we missing something. Is that something to do with the process? So that was quite interesting. Um, it starts getting a bit more complicated now. So this is DO and typically what you'll see is that the BOD will go up and the DO goes down. We all know that. Uh, the likes of pH against BOD. Again, there are relationships there. But unless you've got a parameter like BOD, which means something to us all, it then is only at that point can you then start understanding the, the more traditional parameters. Okay, uh, and it goes on. So I'm just going to skip a few of these and we end up with that. And that is an upstream and downstream of a BOD. So green is the upstream, and there are actually some pollution sources on the upstream side, but you can see the events on the downstream and you've got some clear significant issues and, and just for reference two milligrams per liter is regarded as the limit really anything above that is a pretty poor river we'll start and verging with that and it's just a summary of the data so these are the changes that we found um, going from upstream to downstream um, and probably the big ones really were ammonia but I know the percentage looks big but the, the actual starting value is low so it went from 0.3 to 0.7 BOD 1.45 to 2.02, but you can see how it can work. We've also done, uh, and this is to be taken with a pinch of salt. We've been working uh, on doing some phosphorus samples. So we've done it on various projects, but on this one, we've done about 200 samples upstream and downstream of different catchments and different treatment works. And we got a correlation like that. Okay, uh, this is just for one set. Um, and then what you get a strong correlation um, and we, we do it using algorithms and fluorometers um, and then what that translates into is some lovely data like this so you've got the blue which is the phosphorus again it's following the, the twin peaks which will match more or less the do um, and also the ammonia but look at the ammonia okay this is pretty much three weeks i think and you can see that it's generally increasing upwards and that is perfectly normal for an iron selective electrode. So that is why you've got to go back to site every month to calibrate it. And what will happen is you will bring it down and it will start. I mean, you can actually retro a prior calibration to the data to sort of bring a bit of a linear scale back down. Um, but it was just something that came out and we, we, we started working on it and it could be very potentially useful. Um, uh, and here's the calibration applied now to an upstream and downstream. So this is just phosphorus. So you've got 0.1 typically. And then when we add the downstream, we're getting about two and a half. And you can see the peaks here. Um, what's really interesting, you can see the peak here. If you look carefully, you can see it in a downstream, superimposed on top of the treatment works. Uh, there's a bigger one there as well. Uh, um, Right, okay, so we'll just skip on those. Right, so this is just really about how you show the data. So this is a project we started in 2019 in Chicago. It's been a bit delayed because of um, COVID, 
um, but it actually went live uh, last year. So if anyone's gone to Chicago, it's, um, from a river point of view, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so H2 Now, which are an innovation organization, um, Chicago is known as the water hub of innovation for the whole of the USA. So there's a lot of uh, blue tech companies up there as well. Um, so we work with H2 Now and their whole idea is that they wanted to create um, a public platform to show the water quality in the rivers for the, for the Chicagoans, that's what they're called. Um, so they can make a decision whether they want to go swimming, kayaking, whatever. Okay, um, so it launched in 2021 um, and the date is in real time. It's only run for the bathing water, so they've just been uh, bathing season. It's just been pulled out, so it'll go back in next spring. Um, but the burning question is, why can't we have one? Well, there are a few challenges of that and we understand the disruption caused by this tech and the whole idea of doing it, um, but it's possible. Okay, so this is just a little map really here. So what you have in Chicago is, that's Lake Michigan is a clean water, fresh water source. You have the North Branch coming down and then the South Branch coming down. And those three triangles here are the probes. Okay, one's right outside Trump Tower on the main stem, the, the green section. Okay, and historically, they fed from north and south, met at the main stem and flowed into the Chicago River. Problem was, just above where it says Chicago, is the main treat works for the whole of uh, Chicago. And so they were polluting their own water source. So in true American fashion, no engineering job. And if you go to Chicago, it's full of great engineering. They reversed the river. So they completely reversed the South Branch, built a canal over to the Mississippi. And now the water goes down to um, the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so they solved their pollution problems and drinking water problems. But we've now got these three probes that provide the real-time data. Um, and it's just a little video here. Hopefully this is going to work. What a beautiful afternoon to be live on the river. And the Chicago River, we all know the story, right? Turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. Flow is reversed to keep the sewage from the city from getting out into the cribs and into the drinking water. Problem solved, right? Well, not quite, but we're getting pretty close. Let's check out a new tool that we're using. It's always nice to know before you go, and a new tool, H2 Now, provides just that. Knowledge about the fecal content of the Chicago River for folks who want to spend some time on it. And yes, you heard that right. We care about fecal coliform, like, why do we care about poop in the river? It, it's not because it's actually inherently hazardous to people. It's because it's often an indicator that there's other bacteria and viruses in the river that we might be more concerned about. And so that's why we're testing this novel sensor. The truth is, this isn't something unique to just the Chicago River. Fecal coliform is put into every river by both animals and humans and occasionally worsened by severe weather. Extreme rain events can lead to something called combined sewer overflows. When those happen, there's actually sewage that goes into the river. When that happens, you do want to exercise high caution and stay away from the river for a period of a couple of days till things settle down. In the past, the way the data was collected was someone to have to come down here, physically sample the water, then send it out for analysis. And while you're waiting, just a stray rainstorm could drastically alter the chemistry of the water. Now you get that data in near real time. What we need to be concerned about is the climate feature that's ahead of Chicago means more wet weather and more intense rainstorms. So our concern is really that the trajectory of those improvements might change. And we want to know what's happening in the river and be tracking it in real time so we can stay ahead of that. And uh, it's super simple to do, and the website interface is pretty slick. It's h2nowchicago.org. We put a link to it on our website as well as the story after we're done. Uh, and it's great. It's got a little dial on it. It shows you exactly where the level is. Every 15 minutes, it's updated. A super way. Thank you. We'll finish that off. Um, and just to conclude on that one, um, is this is a typical sort of array of data. And you've got a mixture of rainfall events and CSO events, which they can pick up. Um, and it's worked to be really effective. Uh, they've just won an award for it, so um, really good project. Um, right, so I'm just gonna sort of roll towards the finish now and just sort of link up with what Nick's been doing earlier um, today. So um, we worked on a, been working on a project with um, Southern Water. So I'm just gonna talk this video through, it's about a minute. Um, so we deployed um, these buoys off the sort of Southern Water coastline 
um, first of which was at Tankerton and also at, at Hayling. Um, so we worked with the councils, the Southern Water and uh, the Environment Agency to launch these. Uh, this is just a bit of a video of one of the launches. This is the one off Hayling Island. Um, in order to test it, what we've done, uh, well, I think we said what we've done, is that Nick and Alex Ford, they actually did spike testing themselves. So from a testing point of view, couldn't ask for any better, the client's done it. So great data, proves that it's working. Now we're trying to get a few extra calibration samples on the, on the very lower end of the scale. Um, and the next challenge, obviously, for, for Nick and for us is how do we get that data on the, on the web and so people can use and view it. I'm just going to finish off now. One minute, okay. So what we learned, these five parameters are only context. We need to think a little bit further along, okay. And how useful are these? And where do you put them? You know, you, you need to have a fully mixed flow in a river before you get a representative sample. So you've got to be a lot of thought about where that downstream site goes, okay. And let's be honest, a lot of sensors are just not going to be able to pick it up. Um, so we've got the likes of, D of DO. A CSO could be more aerated than the river. Even though it's got biological content and BOD or whatever, the impact of that is going to happen two days downstream, not at the source. Stability. It, it could be the complete opposite of what you think. And ammonia, I've obviously talked about this. Um, you know, and what will it mean to anybody? And if you get that plus 0.04, is that a measurement error? You might find that the, the upstream one is actually um, higher than the downstream one. Um, so the difference is likely to be outside specification. And the reality of all of this is that you've got going to have relatively inaccurate, insensitive and drifting ammonia sensors. I know it sounds like I'm shooting myself on the foot, I'm being completely honest with you. This is the truth, okay? So the calibration intervals really need to be extended. You don't want to go out there every month. Go every three or six, okay? Um, and yeah, the, the issue you're gonna have is that practitioners are gonna have a completely different view on the same set of data. Um, and therefore, it tells us what we need is definitive data that relates back to actual guidelines and legislation. Um, okay, so the likes of BOD and COD can provide real scale and impact. Okay, again, E. coli and Cocky, but other bathing waters. And, and, and we've shown really some of these um, sort of uh, projects that you can actually achieve it. Um, so yeah, it's been really exciting. It's been the hardest part of all of it has been the disruption. It's a disruptive technology. So that's me done. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.